Good morning, and from myself a personal welcome, Kelos Ethete. I am David Emerson. It is my real honor to be asked to moderate this session this morning. We will have two short presentations and then the maximum time available within the formal layout of this room to encourage discussion and to have a conversation. In this opening session, we want to frame our discussion as the questions in your program suggest. What is new and different? What lessons have we learned? What experience can we use already and bring? To start our discussion this morning, we are most fortunate to have two key pieces of knowledgeable input. But we all believe that the expertise and the experience lies with you in this room. And that is what we must draw out, your knowledge, your experience, your contribution. That is what we will be aiming to do in this session. So we start with the two presentations. And in your packs, you will have had a position statement from each of our speakers and a biography. And perhaps you might even have read them by now. But to save time and to make the most of the time for us, I am going to assume you have read them and I am not going to get, reproduce either their introductions or their biographies, except to say a little each. We are going to start with Rui Villar and I can only say he has the most distinguished biography, academic, political and public service, and latterly with the Kalus Gobenkin Foundation. And we hand over to you, Rui. Good morning. I'd like, first of all, to thank Stravos Nyarkos Foundation for this invitation and for the hospitality. After the inspiring visit to the Acropolis Museum yesterday, we have no excuse to be inventive and hard workers. And uh, as it was said in the introduction, we all are experiencing difficult and demanding times in our work. And uh, this opportunity to learn from each other is obviously very important. With different degrees in all European countries, we are facing increasing pressure to respond to growing demands from our beneficiaries and our stakeholders. Unemployment is growing to inhuman levels, particularly for long-term unemployed and for young people leaving school and leaving universities. The traditional social transfers from governments are being reduced due to fiscal constraints. And social tensions are increasing, particularly in societies with minorities, with immigrants groups. We all are experiencing that. And the weak are becoming weaker the elderly people, children at risk, and the old and the new poor in our societies. We all must be clear that the mere financial transfer of resources will be a drop in this ocean of needs. And second, that foundations cannot replace the role of governments and public policies. But we need to give our stakeholders 
a clear message. And uh, being in Belfast one month ago for the EFC AGA, I came across with a book about the life of Joseph Rountree. And uh, he wrote this almost one century and a half ago. Charity as ordinary practiced, the charity of endowment, the charity of emotion, the charity which takes the place of justice creates much more of the misery it relieves, but does not relieve all the misery it creates. I like to underline the charity which takes the place of justice. And this, these are words of the 19th century. Today would say charity which takes the place of change, of social innovation. But the spirit is exactly the same. And this is the message that foundations should give to their stakeholders. In order to avoid too much expectations, too much frustration for our beneficiaries and for ourselves in our day-by-day -day work. This crisis is new and long-term. Economists, for a while, were discussing if it was a V, a double V, or a U, like the glacier valleys. I think that it's more like an L, we are still in the flat situation and the signs of growing are tepid, as the IMF said yesterday or day before yesterday about the US economy. And uh, the traditional e policy, economic policy theories Keynes versus Schumpeter, both don't seem applicable to present circumstances. So it's a, a big opportunity for the academic work in economic theory to help us to find new ways to address the present crisis. And uh, for foundations, it's of course time to an innovation-driven structural change. On the other end, we cannot go on working in isolation. Foundations, ONGs, other civil society organizations must try to work together. And we must try to build a shared agenda within ourselves, but also with the public and the private sector. It's not easy at national level, and it's even more difficult at transnational level, but it's our duty to build common agenda. We have a common cause, we must have a shared agenda. And third, foundations being independent and uh, long-term institutions can be the catalysts for change and for new partnerships. We always speak today about innovation. I, I used that word several times, so allow me also to be a bit innovative in lexical terms. So, foundations to, to be effective must be acupuncturistics. What do I mean? To identify small places 
where our intervention can make a big difference and be replicable. Do not try to do too many pilot projects where we spend money, sometimes with very interesting ideas, but that are not replicated, so they stay in our bookshelves as interesting pieces of work, but they have no impact. Try to be effective, like the Chinese doctors, that with a small piece of iron can relieve a big pain. So let's try to learn to be a culturists. We also speak a lot about biological agriculture, so let us be horticulturalists, planting small seeds that can grow and which other can also water. I will give you one example of our own experience at the Gulbenkian Foundation. We launched in the neighborhoods of Lisbon, where there are a lot of social tensions with different uh, immigrant communities from Brazil, from Africa, from Eastern countries, from people, from Portuguese that came from the interior, from agriculture and are now living around the city looking for new jobs. And one of the problems with parents that were leaving home quite early and arriving quite late was how to keep children at school. And uh, we did not try to invent the wheel. We imported the Generation Orchestra the El Sistema Orchestra from Venezuela that produced Dudamel, one of the world's most well-known conductors. And we built in a school in the neighborhood of Lisbon one of these orchestras. We supplied the instruments. We asked for two Venezuelan teachers to come and to train the Portuguese teachers and we build an orchestra with around 50 young students from many different origins, most of them second or third generation uh, uh, of immigrants. And then after a few months of training, First of all, the instruments were well kept. No instrument appeared to be sold in the Marche Opus of Lisbon. And they were invited to play in our auditorium, where usually we have our music season with our orchestra. Then many other schools replicated this idea. And now we have around 500 young musicians playing and learning how to play music with the system invented by Antonio Abreu El Sistema. This helped them to recover self-esteem, to keep them at school, and now they are bringing their families to assist to their concerts. And that helps to create new relations between school, teacher, and students, and between communities. So we planted a small seed. Others are watering other seeds, and it's, it's growing. Foundations must be conveners. Stavros Niarchos Foundation is our convener today, but we must act as conveners of other institutions. 
to establish new partnerships, to foster new forms of collaboration, and to gain more effectiveness, both at national and transnational level. We can be catalysts of change, we can be conveners of others, and through cross-fertilization to increase our effectiveness. Now I come to more classical lexical words. Foundations must be auditors of themselves. We must, from the beginning of a project, incorporate an evaluation system. And we must teach our beneficiaries that they must help to evaluate the impact of our work. Without evaluation, we cannot make progress and we cannot learn. And finally, we should be coaches. The European football championship ended a few days ago. I recall that Greece had a Portuguese coach and we are obviously very proud of the good results of that cross-fertilization. But foundations must be coaches. We must help other civil society organizations to build up, to scale up, to be bigger than self. And that is one of our main jobs to help capacity building training people, putting organizations using in a better way the scarce resources that they have. And finally, we must be humble as we are not looking for re-election in the new, in the coming election. As we are not looking to appear in the front page of the newspapers or in the headlines of TV news at 8 in the evening. We must be humble, learning from our mistakes and learning from each other, like we will try to do today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shireen, for such an insightful set of observations to kick us off. I'm not sure you should have referred to football when we have the representative of the winning country speaking next, but uh, that will give him extra confidence. Could I introduce Angel Font Vidal, again, whose biography is in your pack, but who I am just astounded can combine three disciplines. I struggled even to manage one, so uh, we're in awe of that and the combined with the experience which you have of the foundation, Angel. Thank you. And talking uh, after Embry is not easy. But anyway, thank you for your comment on football championship. We are very proud of it. It was, it was only fair play. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyway, good morning, everybody. And I would like also to start thanking uh, Starburniarcos Foundation for inviting La Caixa Foundation to this uh, a relevant event. We're very happy to be here and sh share also our experience in this in this time that we have to face on economic and social crisis in our countries. We have been asked to explain how La Caixa Foundation has faced these effects of the crisis, but before starting, I'd like to share with you one thought. I would like to explain why we consider that La Caixa Foundation is a different organization to other banking institutions. La Caixa was founded 100 years ago in the middle of a very big social and economic crisis. And in that moment, the aim was to allow workers to save some money to have a pension fund. 
this was the original aim. And that allows La Caixa to become uh, in financial institutions nowadays. This original aim had a deep social commitment at that time because it was the way to support weak people uh, in the society at that time. And in that moment, they, La Caixa contributes heavily to create one of the pillars of our welfare society, as was commented this morning, that it was the pension system. Today, as I mentioned, La Caixa has become the main retail banking operator in Spain, but we at the foundation, we try to keep this social commitment through our programs. Normally, we say in our communication that the foundation is the spirit of La Caixa. This is the, the, the motto that we use. And this is why we try to continue the same that the founders done 100 years ago. But uh, we have to talk about today, not about 100 years ago, but the reality is not so different. It's a crisis. And the economic and social crisis has hit uh, Spanish society hard, as you know. Social indicators show high levels of inequality due to the failure of our labor market. Unemployment affects one in four Spaniards, and we have close to two million households well, where all members are unemployed. This is a big uh, figure. However, these figures, uh, before the crisis, inequality in our country was evident. In 2007, one in five were poor in Spain, and one in three left school too early. In fact, was in that moment the effect of our real estate boom that allowed a lot of young uh, people not to finish the studies because in the uh, real estate industry they have a good job, uh, fresh money, and they not allowed to finish the, the studies. And also we had, uh, before the crisis, an, a big migration issue. I have to remember you that during the last decade, the 2000 decade, every two migrants who arrived to Europe, one has arrived to Spain. So we, we have become, in 10 years, having from 3% of migration rate to close to 13% of migration rate. So it's a big change. It's a big effort to uh, try to also integrate those amount of people and those amount of different problems. For that reason, even in 2005, La Caixa Foundation started to think about this reality. Before that, La Caixa Foundation was focused on cultural issues. We had a network of, uh, of different equipments on exhibitions and all our cultural events. We were focused on that issues, but from 2005 from now, we made a big move toward the new social program for portfolio. So we anticipate some time uh, the, the, the crisis, and thanks of that, we have now a variety of programs that is, has been listed in the in the paper that you that you have in your uh, material, but it's mainly focused on. For instance, one, point, one, one of the biggest points in our case is child poverty. We allocate, it's our main program in terms of budget. We allocate every year close to 50 million euros. And it's a partnership with local authorities and a network of more than 300 NGOs all over Spain. We are working in the main 10 cities in Spain. Working in child poverty, that means working with uh, children living in, in poor families. So it's a family program, in fact. The second one is job placement, so helping people who are out of the uh, labor market to find a job. The third one is social housing, that is allowing that empty flats will be used for poor families uh, in affordable rent. Fourth one is microfinance, allowing people to have self-employed. And the last one is social entrepreneurship, trying to innovate in the way that NGOs and social activities has been made and trying to put more uh, sustainability, also economic sustainability, in the social activity. Within the last 
uh, few years, we have had good lessons on these programs. Probably we have, we know better how not to do things than how the things has to do. But anyway, this experience is also interesting and we are very happy to share with you. Probably we, I will, we will have time during the discussion to, to highlight some of these lessons. But uh, to, to be careful with the time that I had, I stop here. I thank you very much for your attention. I am open to, to the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angle. So now we come to involving yourselves. And while you are thinking of your questions, and I know you will be all thinking of many questions each, let me explain how we will do this. You will all have been to conferences where it takes a long time for the microphone to get between people. So I will be asking all through the session just to indicate to me that you want to speak, and I will put one speaker and then the next speaker to follow so that the microphone can get to you and then we shall not lose time waiting for the microphone. Also, we come from a very wide area of, across Europe. It would just help when you speak just to say something about who you are or where you come from, just briefly so that we know a little about who you are, just your name or somewhere, but just something. And so I have two people with microphones who are just getting ready now, and they will come. And I think I will invite, you have been thinking, questions. I will indicate who would like to speak. And we are not just taking questions. We are not just interrogating the panel. We would like your experience, your comments. And so who is the most exciting person to start a hand? I have spotlights. Lovely. At the lady at the back there and anyone else? All throughout, just indicate to me in the second there. Thank you. Thank you. The microphones will be on. Just allow a second for our friends to put them up at the back. Are you okay, technicians? Yes, it should be okay. It's all right. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Eva Polizogopoulou. I work for the Established Nervous Foundation. Uh, just the put the microphone a little. Sorry. Lovely. The programs department. Uh, my question is uh, to maybe both of our speakers for the first workshop. How would you describe the break-even point? Because you mentioned that the foundations should not replace the state, but they should uh, work as substitutes of the state. How would you describe that break-even point, uh, especially in countries that go through an economic crisis? Thank you. Thank you. Shall I take the second question, and that gives two together, and then? Come to anybody, we'll have an answer and then come afterwards. Thank you very much. My name is Markus Hipp. I'm the BMW, uh, executive director of BMW Foundation, coming from Germany, Berlin. Uh, first, thank for the great uh, impact this morning already. My question is not to our guest speakers, it's to some of, the, of you because it's about learning. If you want to um, learn together and bring us in how to develop also specific questions in Greece. I would like to hear something about uh, the, some numbers about what are foundations here in, in Greece? Some numbers, how many and uh, how many money is behind? How many uh, organization power of, is there an association of uh, Greek foundation already existing? One, on, on the other side, some information about the civil society here about NGOs and social enterprises, so I have no idea and uh, you invited us to learn and before I can bring in something I would like to learn and I'm sure some experts about that are here. Thank you very well, much. Well, those are two wonderful questions. Thank you so much and I hope those of you, I have noted you, that works lovely, thank you. Uh, and I hope you can be thinking also about the answer to that question. Can I invite either of you to make some thoughts, reactions? Louis? Louis? Well, it's... Uh... It's a big question because uh, traditionally foundations were looked as subsidiary of the work of uh, the state. And in a certain uh, uh, way, historically, when uh, the public services were small, civil society and the church, for instance, were replacing uh, areas that are now clearly 
of the responsibility of the state. But uh, as it was said in one of the introductory speeches, uh, now it's probably time to replace the social welfare state by a social welfare society. What are for me the, the, the biggest difference and maybe the, the drawing line between public sector and foundations? Foundations cannot uh, do permanent activities and those are of the responsibility of the public sector. We cannot assure uh, without time limit that we will gi go on giving grants for this or for that. So that makes part of the deal we must uh, agree with our beneficiaries that our intervention as foundations must have time limit. And that is why uh, we cannot look to replace, for instance, the unemployment subsidies. But we can help people through entrepreneurship training to move from unemployment to their own activities. And microcredit is a very good example. Maybe foundations are not prepared to do themselves microcredit, but they can help other institutions to do. At the Gulbenkian Foundation, we trained microcredit uh, appraisal systems and we gave them to other institutions in order that they can evaluate better the demands of microcredit. And uh, the second drawing line is that uh, we act in a different way. Uh, governments are obliged to treat all citizens, citizens equally because all are equally to the law. But foundations can choose and can take risks and are not obliged to give the equal sum to everybody that demands it. So we can be more focused and try to have more impact. Our method and our geography is different from the method and geography of the public sector. Rui, thank you. Angle, do you want to add anything? Just, just to complement this point, I think I can share with you that the, the theory of this collaboration, private-public collaboration, and also some practical uh, points. Uh, I think, in, in theory, we, we had agreements with the public administration starting new programs. They, they asked us to we, we can be more flexible, more, in, more innovative than uh, public administration. So they ask us to try to uh, start a new paradigm, a new program, something like that. Once it's proved, one is test, one is uh, clear, they can expand it to the rest of, 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 the, of the community or something like that. This is the theory. And it, it, it finds, it, it, it works in the paper. But uh, in, under our experience, it, it is not working on, on, on the practice. So once uh, we had no real successful experience trans transferring programs to the administration, this was, this was the, the original aim. And in fact, we have some, some of them. But uh, the, 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 the big ones uh, that in these days has to be moved, transferred to the administration that allow us to start new uh, innovation for the public. Uh, just in this moment, the public administration is saying to, to us, no, we, can, we cannot afford it, so please keep it for a, more, for a more long time because we cannot afford in this moment, the, the, we are dismantling our social services, so no, we cannot take, take from your part. So. Uh, I think it works. It will work probably in the future that as a foundation we, we, we can take more risk, we can innovate, we can do uh, pilot 
uh, uh, programs that can be enlarged and transferred to, this, to the public administration, and we will continue struggling in that direction. But in the real world, this is not so easy. A quick postscript from Rui, and then thank you. You've been wonderful. I have eight people lined up already, so we will come back to you. Rui, a quick comment. Just to, to, to give a, an example of uh, what I consider good cooperation between uh, the Gulbenkian Foundation and the state, a few years ago, we launched a, a program for the recognition of diploma of immigrant doctors and nurses, particularly from immigrants from the Eastern European countries. There were a lot of doctors and nurses working in restaurants and in construction. And uh, in the Portuguese National Health Service, we had lack of doctors and nurses. So we, we launched the program uh, for the recognition of their diploma. After first initial difficulties with the Portuguese College of Doctors that were not uh, very helpful, uh, and you understand easily why, uh, uh, the program was launched and uh, we had the first wave of more than 100 doctors that got the recognition of their diplomas and that, that are now working in our hospitals with great success. And after that first program, the Ministry of Health replicated it, asking us with public money to do a second wave of that program. And uh, this collaboration went very well and in a very successful way. Uh, way. Thank you. The lady in the centre, and I missed the, that's, thank you, and the next one down here, and you're about number nine now, I'm afraid, but you're clocked, sorry. Uh, the second microphone down here, and off to you. Nice, thank you. I'm Helen Benecki, I work for the Piraeus Bank Group Culture Foundation, a private bank here in Greece. I would like to address a question to Mr. Dival. What is exactly your financial um, uh, relation to the Kaixa Bank, uh, do you get uh, the whole budget for the foundation from the bank or do you have other alternative uh, resources for your revenues? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Do you want to hold a second? I'll take the second comment. Now we've got the microphone to you just in time. Yes, my name is Ebi Hatibarnava. I'm representing Home Start Worldwide. Um, my question is that since we are experiencing a situation of economic crisis, and I'm talking particularly from, for Greece, it is not very easy to um, uh, present evidence of sustainability, uh, of uh, what is going to happen after you know, the foundation sort of money uh, and project expires. Uh, are foundations more likely to take greater risks in these kind of situations? Thank you both very much. We'll come to gentlemen there later. Quick comment, thoughts, any reactions? Uh, on the concrete question, uh, uh, La Caixa Foundation is funded by uh, the financial income mainly, so 90% of our incomes now come from the banking. Not only the banking, La Caixa has two main businesses, the financial one, and also a, a network of uh, industrial companies. So uh, from business side, uh, we, uh, we receive 90% uh, of our funds, and we are now also trying to increase this 5% into a 10 or 20% in the future, but uh, we are struggling now in that, in, in that uh, area. So fundraising has not been uh, a big point in our foundation because we have received money from the bank regularly in the last years. Thank you. Okay, uh, and related to the second question on sustainability, I think that you highlight the most important point nowadays because how, how we can sustain social activity. That was the rationale that allows us to start our last social program that I mentioned briefly before. 
that we call social entrepreneurship, but the, the idea is that uh, new entrepreneurs that wanted to uh, improve the society in different ways, these new ideas, the, 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 the way will not be the same NGO structure that we have been in the last uh, decades, but probably a combination of business income and uh, other incomes will, will be the best one. So the way to, to sustain social activity in the future will be, in our, uh, in our mind, a combination of business-like and non-business-like uh, incomes in the future. So that it's a big change because for us, is we, we are experimenting on that field because it's not easy, it's not evident to move charitable, charitable or public money and change it by private one. They transform completely the way the values that they are insi inside or something like that. So we are experimenting. We have a very little program uh, with a capital seat for 25 initiatives all over Spain. And probably in three years time, I can answer better your question. If this experiment is fine, if there is another way to do social impact with less uh, uh, public money or philanthropic money, uh, it will be great. If not, it will be at the same time, at the same position. But in what uh, our commitment was to experiment with that, and with you know, we chose between 1,000 initiatives. We chose only 25, and we are supporting with business skills with seed capital and with some mentoring during the issue. So I, I invite you in three, in three years to, to talk again and share the results of this program. Right. Okay. Ruby, do you want to say a couple of things? Yep. Yes, I, I, I think that um, <clears throat> this question is uh, uh, a crucial uh, uh, one, particularly in countries uh, like my own country, where social NGOs depend around 40% on their activity from government subsidies. So volunteer work, uh, their own endowment, donations, and so on, represent only uh, one half of their resources. And with the, the, the fiscal constraints and reduction of public expenditure, many of those organizations are at risk, and uh, there is the risk of losing volu volunteer work and their own resources. Uh, how to cope with this uh, is uh, of such a dimension that uh, we cannot replace the state. So what we are trying to do is to try to help those organizations to make better use of their own resources, to train people in management, because most of them were based on the, what Joseph Rontri called the charity of emotion. Very good will, but lack of professionalism. And training people to be more efficient, it will be certainly the best way to give them a minimum of conditions of sustainability. But the situation is at a real risk. Thank you. The gentleman there and then the lady there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robin Niblett uh, from Chatham House in London. Um, I was struck in particular by Angel's comments about the rise in unemployment. I mean, the area in which Spain, if you look at those figures there, has really just performed so much worse than anyone else has been in the rise of unemployment. Um, and I notice your comments as well that trying to work with governments is particularly difficult. They don't follow through. They can't do what uh, the idea of being horticulturalists, you know, you, you plant a seed, then the water comes in. Uh, the governments are not stepping forward. So I'm wondering about companies as partners. If unemployment is the real problem, to what extent are you as foundations working these days with the private sector uh, to try to create that linkage, that partnership, that convening function that would allow some of your projects that are seeded to then really take root. If governments can't step up, 
Uh, to what extent are companies becoming partners for the next phase of, of your work? For question to both of you. Thank you. I will take the second question. I've got about five more questions lined up, but not forgetting a very helpful question at the beginning, some information, some numbers, what's happening in Greece. So the lady there, and then the microphone to, in the front row, please. Hello, yeah, my name's Jenny Clark. I've been involved in various um, NGO training and capacity development projects, mainly in the UK. And so I was interested to note the point um, in the first presentation about the role of foundations acting as coaches, helping to develop civil society. And I'd be interested to hear both speakers' thoughts on that role of foundations. Thank you very much. We're still doing very much questions of the panel, but feel free to make comments, observations, suggestions. I've got four more lined up. And who would like to angle? Yes, on the uh, job placement uh, issue that you mentioned, unemployment. Uh, uh, let's say we, we launched a job placement program seven years ago, thinking how to allow people completely out of the labor market to, to go in because uh, the unemployment rate in that moment that we launched the program in Spain was around 8%. So, and the state, the, 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 the government has a big network of offices that allow people to, when there is unemployed, to, to have from train and, and, uh, and come back to the market. And we focus on um, disabled people, people coming, f f for instance, this program had a specific program, people coming from jail to, to get a job, or something like that. So we focused specifically on those groups who are uh, vulnerable and most difficulties to reach the labor market. Nowadays, the situation is completely different. The network of uh, branches, public branches that uh, helping people to find a job or to, to, to train, to have some training or something like that is being reduced because the, the state has no, with the fiscal constraints, they, they have to reduce this expense. That is, for me, a big mistake because we are, we are um, cutting money from the active labor policies. In that days, but we have to face with the, 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 the reality. So, so uh, in our program, we have to move from a program that uh, attends specifically those who have no access to, to the market. I mentioned disabled prisoners or offenders or, or something like that. But now we are trying to deal with quite normal people that simply lost her job or his job and, 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 and need some support. Uh, so so the, the, the idea was to be really a complement of the public policies because the main public policies work well in that moment and now we are trying to move to, to another one. Which is our advantage in, in this program that as La Caixa Foundation we have big relationship with uh, 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 companies. Uh, specifically, our bank is specialized in retail banking, so it's fami families and SMEs. So we have good contact with a big network of SMEs all over S Spain that we have some easy contact to, to, to allow them. If, if, the, if every SME in Spain uh, uh, get a, a new employee, the unemployment in Spain will reduce at, at half. This, this is the reality because our economy is based on SMEs. So we, we are trying to take advantage of this relationship in terms of uh, business uh, uh, that we have relation with SMEs and trying them to, to, be, to, to support this program. By, uh, by showing different options and uh, convincing them that it's a good moment to, to hire somebody. Thank you. you, okay? you know? Well, the, the first question uh, is uh, really a very important window for, for discussion. 
we do not have too much experience of working with uh, private companies, although we work with foundations built by private companies. But uh, uh, in present circumstances, we do not have the level of unemployment of Spain, but our figure is 14%, so it's extremely high from a tradition of having 6 or 6.5% unemployment. And at the same time, we have 5% of our workforce represented by immigrants. So the tension between unemployed people uh, of different nationalities is a growing one, and we, we must uh, look at it quite uh, carefully. One uh, uh, example of uh, importing ideas from uh, uh, private uh, investors was a program that we launched to the Portuguese diaspora, to Portuguese emigrants that became successful entrepreneurs in other countries. And uh, we asked them to, in a, a kind of uh, ideas contest, to present projects that could be, in a certain way, re-imported, as they were successful in France, in the States, in Brazil, in uh, Venezuela, elsewhere in the world where there are Portuguese emigrants. How could them replicate those projects in Portugal? because they, were, they got experience in more competitive markets, in more difficult circumstances. And uh, we got uh, around uh, 10 very good ideas. We gave 50,000 euros to each of one to replicate their initiatives in Portugal. And this was a successful uh, new way of building up new entrepreneurs coming from the experience of Portuguese uh, uh, emigrants. Now, the question of promoting civil society. Foundations are, uh, as I said, can be horticulturalists. We can put new seeds in the land, but we need to create, to create the right climate for people to get together and to launch new projects. And in societies that historically were both very much dependent from the state and from the church, civil society is something that we must push by example. And uh, the best way is to give good examples. But it's in some cases a hard work because a lot of people react that is the duty of the state to deliver. And we know that state will not deliver. And of course the resources of the church are not as big as they were when social needs were quite different from the present ones. Uh, Angela, you wanted to come yeah, back? Yeah, on this second question, the role of foundations promoting civil society, if I understand properly your question, I have to say that in our case, we, we, we have written our mission, that our mission is, is not to help associations, is to help people. Uh, associations, civil society organizations are partners, but they are not benefic beneficiaries. That, that, that's, that's why we, we are trying to avoid um, having to be a, a program to save uh, local associations, because uh, for sure in Spain we will have a serious problem because of the, because I think in Spain it's even bigger, the, dependency of local NGOs and associations from the public subsidies is close to 50 percent. 
So, uh, and this amount of money from different administration will reduce more or less to the, to the half in the coming years. So for sure that uh, there will be associations, there will be civil society organizations that will close, that will reduce activity, uh, that will become more volunteering than, uh, than services providers or something like that. Uh, our aim is to continue having partners in the civil society organization, but not beneficiaries. That, that means that we will continue taking into account that to deliver our services, to, to, to implement our programs, we will take into account that always when, when a, a local organization is implemented, this will be the, the best solution. But uh, our role is not trying to save uh, civic uh, society organizations. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if, if you understand my, my, my point. I, I think that's an interesting point because some of the foundations in the UK have said that our role is not to support per se all the voluntary organizations, but what is the need, what are the beneficiaries, which of those organizations are best suited in the climate to support beneficiaries. I have two questions here and we'll just pass the microphone back and then the third one, meanwhile, if the microphone could go over to the, my left. Thank you, Jerry. It's really not a question, so with my That's excuses good. to the to Rui around, lovely, and Angel, I'm going to address the audience. Um, I, I'm very fortunate to have uh, just come back from uh, Ireland yesterday. Uh, I met with uh, the Prime Minister and a couple of ministers uh, because they're launching a new program. And I was so inspired, in fact, by what I heard that I thought I might share it with you. Um, Ireland has two very big foundations. One of them is called the Atlantic Philanthropies, and the other is called uh, the One Foundation. Both of these organizations are going out of business. They're spending out. They're, in fact, spending all their money. Uh, the One Foundation will be out of business in a year and the Atlantic Philanthropies will be out of business in three years. So the Irish government was very conscious of the fact that it was losing two of its major foundations. Uh, I was totally inspired by the fact that a prime minister, two ministers, civil servants, knew enough about philanthropy to talk about it, to talk about what they needed to do, and to talk about how important it was in the infrastructure that they need to build. So yesterday they launched a uh, four-pronged program, uh, which I think touches on some of the issues you're discussing. Uh, they decided, first of all, that they need to incentivize giving in their society. And in order to do that, they're making taxation uh, concessions at the moment of crisis. I happened to leave just as the Troika was tr flying into uh, Ireland. Uh, to discuss uh, their, uh, their bailout, and so I just thought that was very relevant. But the fact that they're considering making taxation uh, concessions for citizens so that citizens can participate in philanthropy, I thought was very important. The second thing was a commitment on the part of the philanthropic infrastructure in Ireland to do something very profound about improving the fundraising skills of the NGO community in Ireland as a major commitment on the part of the foundations. The third thing that they're doing is there, there is a private-public partnership between government and the philanthropies to actually do something together, which is to create a fund for social enterprise. A real new money being put on the table by philanthropic and business and government to create new enterprises in a, in a condition of crisis. And the last and possibly uh, the most predictable one uh, one of saying, well, we have a diaspora, we need to find ways in which the diaspora can do cross-border giving in an easier and simplistic way. And so uh, we got the uh, support of the Irish government for something that the EFC has been fighting for called the European Foundation Statute. But all of that for me is, is a, is a multi-pronged approach by a government and by philanthropy. But what blew me away was the fact that these people knew what philanthropy was, what it was capable of, didn't expect it to substitute, but really understood what philanthropy could offer and were willing to put 
right in the middle of the crisis, their, their, their resources on the table. I just thought I might share that with you. Jerry, thanks Thank so you. much. And while you're passing the microphone to the lady behind you, just to comment, that's a couple of times we've had this reference, the diaspora, to, you know, native, appealing to those outside of the country. The lady here and then the gentleman there. I'm Athena Linou. I'm from Greece. I'm here on behalf of Prolepsis. Uh, I wanted to raise an issue that has not been raised up until now. We, we heard about the three pillars of society, public, private sector, and foundations. But we have seen, especially in the Middle East and uh, uh, African countries, the people to be become self-organized through social media and uh, to produce results, positive or negative. And I was wondering, how can foundations use these dynamics as they develop uh, to uh, expand their philanthropic uh, uh, interventions through the people themselves, either by providing the people providing uh, material or non-material goods, as you said before. And uh, probably I would like to hear a little more of the involvement of the private sector, not simply in uh, uh, social, corporate social responsibility or uh, dealing with unemployment, but also providing uh, ideas of innovation beyond social innovation, new materials, new ways of transferring uh, uh, help that could be innovative and substituted by the companies. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll ask another question, but I think it's really, I suspect other people in this room will have experience of the social, uh, social media, and I hope they may contribute. I'll ask the gentleman there, and meanwhile, your microphone to go. Yes, my name is Aslak Siramire. I represent uh, the House of Literature in Oslo, where I am the director. It's in Norway. Uh, and I have a question and a remark that hopefully touches us on, upon both the acupuncturist and the autoculturist part of foundation's <laughs> role. It's in another, as the last question, on another field and the things that have been debated until now. Uh, in my opinion, at least, the precondition for a solution to the crisis in Europe today uh, is to have a public sphere where the problems that actually uh, evade now are being debated. And not only a public sphere, a public debate, but a common public sphere uh, and common public debate. Both in a national level, for instance, in Greece, in Portugal, in Sweden, in Ireland, in Norway altogether, but perhaps also on a European level at this uh, time, this being a European crisis trying to be solved in the framework of Europe with, uh, without such a public sphere. And the social crisis, which I, I'm addressing now, that comes after the financial crisis, uh, goes hand in hand with another crisis, uh, which is the crisis of traditional media. Uh, and that's happened in a long time. It's due to the internet, you all know this, paper media going down, and with that also crisis of journalism. And Facebook has not replaced uh, the European, and it's not replaced the local newspapers in villages all over Europe, and it's not replaced the common debate that used to be the post-Second World War. So my question and, and my remark is if foundations can participate in creating a new uh, common public sphere and common public debate that makes it possible to address the social issues that are now growing. Social issues that's of, of course of poverty, which we are talking about now, of ethnicity, of nationality, of immigration, all these things. In my opinion, this kind of public debate is being uh, undermine from three uh, different directions. First of all, the ability to participate. Can you read? Can you write? Do you have the possibility to get in? Here we're talking about schooling, which have been addressed. But the second part is, do you actually have the media? Is there actually radio, TV, uh, internet, social media, or newspapers where you can debate, that everybody reads, that everybody sees, that everybody participates in? And then thirdly, do you have the common spaces? Do you have the spaces where people can meet and debate, the public spaces? Uh, and, and I'm quite, quite asking the panel whether uh, the foundations of Europe now are thinking in these directions, trying to go into this, or if, it's, uh, possible, so if, if there's possibilities of doing that kind of acupuncturist work to create a public debate on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Marie, your outline of horticulturists and acupuncturists has been really helpful for us. And we've had some really helpful 
and insightful suggestions about where the scope we should be thinking of. Thank you very much for that. We'll come to you next. I, I'll give the panel a chance to reflect on the questions, uh, observations. Rui, would you like to head off first? Well, I think that the, these are very, very good three topics. First of all, uh, the lady that raised the question how other societies react to difficulties. And uh, you recall the, 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 Middle, the Middle East, the Arab, uh, the Muslim societies, or the African societies. Uh, these are different cultures. And in recent years, in Western societies, we were all under the wave of uh, the neoliberalism doctrine that society will be more efficient if each individual is more and more competitive. So from the 80s, please recall that Mrs. Thatcher said there is no society, there are individuals. And now you are asking us to rebuild society. So we need a, a different tithe because in the last decades, the big wave was towards individualism and individual competitiveness. And that is the, 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 more or less the same question about corporations, about private companies. What the Troika are asking us is to make our companies more competitive, lowering wages, and working and asking the workers to work more hours to make our tradable goods competitive with the tradable goods that come from emerging economies. So if we ask a corporation to be at the same time competitive with the Chinese corporations and do social work, the managers will be in a contradiction. Uh, and that is a cultural problem uh, that we, we need to, to discuss in depth what kind of societies we want to build or rebuild. But uh, we are still in the inertia that uh, Mrs. Thatcher very clearly said when she said there, are no, there is no society, there are individuals. And now we say we need society, we need more society, we need more communitarian spirit, more communitarian help to, to cope with the, the, the social problems we are facing. The other point about media, I entirely agree with you. Uh, fortunately, the Stravos Niarcos Foundation built this agora and uh, let us use the lexicon, the le Greek lexicon. This is an agora to discuss <laughs> the work of foundations and new ways of addressing the social situation. But of course, the traditional media that opens the new series with crimes, tsunami, disasters, how many people were killed by bombs in uh, Pakistan or Iraq is probably not helping to build a new attitude. But uh, the new social communications tools, Facebook, Twitter, and many other things that uh, at my age I am not able to, to understand in depth, but I strongly believe that they can create uh, uh, new forms of building uh, 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 a new attitudes, a new culture. But of course the, the professionals of media can be extremely helpful, as well as the foundations, associations, and particularly EFC. I know that EFC is working hard in communicating, but there is still a gap that Jerry will be obliged to feel to do better communication within our, our world. 
Rory, I'll just make two comments. It's very touching you make reference to the UK, but I'm much more comfortable with jo Joseph Rowntree than being reminded of Margaret Thatcher. So no more of that, please. But I, can I just add, the Carnegie UK Trust are doing a major project you may know about, about the role of the media, and particularly the, the newspaper media, and it, it, it may be something to be, to be aware of if you haven't seen it. Angle. Yes, uh, two words on... Uh, you have addressed a very big uh, question, very big key issue. I, I think both referred why we need foundations today, or what's the main role today of the foundations. And to be honest, I, I, I am still living in a contradiction, and, and it's the same contradiction that you highlight now. That is, from one side in our mission statements and, and the, the, also in the original mission of our organizations, there is a point to transform society, to, to be a catalyst for change. But on the other side, I, I think that we need to be more efficient. And, and so, sometimes both, bo both things could be complementary. But in the real life, some, sometimes it's not so easy. Uh, one month ago, we, we were presenting uh, La Caixa Foundation to the European Commission. And one of the, uh, the members of, of, of the delegation that received us made a comment that, oh, you are like a little commission because you do everything <laughs> like us. So within this situation, probably we, we are not so efficient if we are focusing in one topic or in five topics in, instead of 31. If we are more focusing in, um, in, in, in deeper programs, not always we are in, this, in, the, in the way of being transformative, being uh, a catalyst for change. I, I'm not sure because uh, how to deal with do, those uh, both forces, for me, it's a, it's a big challenge. You're being absolutely terrific. I have eight at least questions lined up. We have 35 minutes. You can do the math, so we need to move on. But to remember still our second question, some of you in those, I hope, are offering some data, some information about Greece. So I'm going to take one of our hosts and then the lady in the centre. Um, I'm Stelios Vasilakis from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, and I have a question for Mr. VR. Just keep the microphone up a little bit, please. Okay. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, um, on an annual basis, the Kulbekian Foundation dedicates 50% of its spending towards organizations and programs outside the foundation, and 50% goes to support um, the two museums that the foundation owns and an orchestra that has full-time 60 musicians. Since we're in the midst of a financial a social crisis, do you find yourself under pressure from the public to tip the scale when it comes to the way that you spend or you use your budget to go more towards programs and organizations outside the foundation and less towards the museums and the orchestra. Even more so since we're talking about the role of foundations, is this also an internal debate within the foundation? Are you debating this internally that there is perhaps a need to change this dynamic? Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to ask our panelists to hold because we, I want to get through some more questions. So if you can just make a note. Can I have the lady here and can that microphone go over to the gentleman in the white shirt over there, please? Thank you. Eva Poulou uh, from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation in, uh, in Greece, in the, the office in Athens. Uh, just as, uh, a brief question about another dilemma that we face often at the office, another debate that we have regarding the, um, the placing of efforts, uh, the difference between placing emphasis on programs and grants that are directed at develop, development and growth, and the extreme need that we have now with alleviation of poverty and suffering, and how you handle this debate internally in, the, in your countries, which are also in crisis. Thank you. Another easy question. You'll roll off in 10 seconds. Uh, and hopefully the gentleman there. Thank you. It should be on. My, my name is Andre Nosko. I work for the Think Tank Fund of the Open Society Foundations, and I have a more of an observation and first of all I'm very thankful that for the organizers to, to put this great event together because these, these are the questions that really we need to discuss. The first one is we talk about the crisis in Europe but I would like to remind us that there are actually crises, plural, uh, in Europe. We organized a small event in March 
where we got together think tankers, people working on policy research across the Europe. And we were quite surprised to learn that what is the crisis across the Europe is quite different. What are the implications and how the crises are felt in various countries is also very different. And I would like to just remind ourselves that as we operate in multiple countries, to try to be, uh, you know, as, as, as you said, to try to be acupuncturist. And different countries need different approaches. It's not always easy. And, you know, we make mistakes. But to try to be as specific for the given context where we operate. Uh, another thing that I would like to invite all of us, and you know, especially when I, w when I saw the, the alarming statistics from Spain, and I was also surprised that the, the comparison column was EU15. What Spain is experiencing right now is much more similar to what Eastern European countries experienced in early 90s, some of them also going through the current times. And I think there is much more to learn across the Europe to see how the societies were coping with the transition, with, with the realignment, with adjustment, you can call it however you want, very painful processes, some of which failed te terribly. And I think that you know, there is mu so much to learn to what didn't work <laughs> and to try to avoid it. Because you know, if we really want to have sustainable societies, then we will somehow need to tackle with the tension that is omnipresent across the whole Europe the tension between democracy and what the markets want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Complex, and I'm going to ask you to be as concise as possible so we get more in. Thank you. Rochep, who would like to go first? Rui? Yep. Well, <clears throat> uh, when I, I heard the first question, I, I felt how relieved I am not being any more the president of the foundation. <laughs> uh, during 10 years, I was, uh, in a certain way, the referee in the board, with my colleagues asking more budget for their own areas. Uh, in, uh, in his will, Kalus Gulbenkian said, the foundation will work in four areas, the arts, education, science, and charity. And he said nothing more. So he didn't try to define a mission. And uh, I, I understand that uh, being a man with a great experience of changes in the world, he didn't try to fix something that would become obsolete for a perpetual institution. But the, the reason why the Kalus Gulbenkian Foundation has so many operative uh, activities has an historical reason. When the foundation was created 56 years ago, Portugal was a dictatorship with a weak economy, with a weak civil society. So it was not possible for the foundation to find adequate organizations to become its grantees. So the foundation started very much as an operative institution. So we have one museum with the founder's collection, that it's our obligation, to keep, we have another museum with, uh, that covers the 20th century and the contemporary art, and it's the unique collection covering all the 20th century in Portugal. We have an orchestra with 66 permanent musicians. We have a choir. Fortunately, the members of the choir are not our employees, but they can grow up to 100. And we have uh, a library open to the public, particularly an art library that is the best, one of the best in Europe. And we have a research center on biology and biomedicine 
that it's an international research institution. 60 or 65% of our researchers are not Portuguese. And uh, when we are exporting uh, young PhDs, we just hired for the new director of our research institute a German researcher. So we also are importing from, from outside. But this is a crucial question. How to, the, to, to allocate our budget between our operative and our grant giving? We are increasing the grant giving side, but I had to struggle with the public opinion in Portugal when in 2005 I decided to close the ballet because we also had a ballet company. And it was a wave of criticism because in a small country like Portugal, a big foundation like Calusco Benken, people expect that we can do almost everything. But it's a permanent debate within ourselves. The trend is to increase gradually the grant giving side. The civil society organizations in Portugal and abroad are more capable to make good use of the financial resources we can provide them. But on the other end, we are offering through our operative activities the possibility of training young people, of creating new jobs. Uh, the best students from our music schools, all of them look for a place in our orchestra. Of course, we do international uh, uh, auditions and uh, we recruit the best, but of course, we have uh, 40% of our musicians are Portuguese, 60% are non-Portuguese. The other big debate is how much should we spend in Portugal, how much should we spend abroad, particularly in developing countries. We cannot forget that uh, we were a colonial empire and that are many countries, many Portuguese-speaking countries, from Brazil to East Timor, that are looking to Calusco Benken Foundation as a provider of new, new grants and new projects. So it's a, a very tough question, and my successor is now dealing with that. As a non-executive, now I am asking him, why do do not more in grant giving. <laughs> of course, of course, he can replicate the answers I gave during the last 10 years of my presidency. Uh, Angle and comments on the, the three. Thanks. Yes, uh, going to the alleviating poverty um, debate that you raised, I, I think it's clear in, in our case, I think that we we had the advantage that the what what we what we call in Spanish uh, giro social that means our big move to the social commitment it was made before that the crisis arrived and it was made for internal reasons so so to be more coherent with our original mission because if not uh, the debate nowadays could be more uh, open or more brave, I think, but, but it, it's still done. In, in, in our case, uh, six to seven years ago, uh, our board decided that two-thirds of our budget will be allocated to social purposes, and only one-third to cultural uh, research and education activities. So th this is our decision and has been not under debate, but when, when the crisis is uh, advancing and when the, if we look the effects of the crisis in the long term, uh, the debate will be more uh, open, I think. Uh, 
let me say a, an example. Uh, uh, Fundació La Caixa has, is the owner of one of the main uh, contemporary art collections in Spain. And, and it was good when, when it's, it was decided it was no private uh, institutions that buy contemporary artworks. It's our role now to continue being this, uh, the, prop, the, the property of this, uh, of this collection. Can we sell some works and have uh, raise some money for social purposes? For sure, if we done this, it will probably will be a piece of new in the newspaper. So we sell a Picasso and we use the money for social purposes. But uh, I, I think I think the debate has to be more in deep. And the reasons why. Uh, during the 70s and the 80s, when the democracy arrived also to Spain, La Caixa Foundation invest in culture w were reasons that were important in that moment. Of course, that situation has changed a lot, but uh, you, you know, it, it's a very open debate now in, at home, and we have a polite solution because our board decided to two thirds of our budget for the next years will be allocated to social purposes and within the social purposes in the uh, programs that affect specifically vulnerable people and that it's a big jump, it's a big change in, in, in our mind and in our age history but we have to, to be clear that the other activities that the foundation has done, they are good activities and they are positive for the society and be because if not it's, it's this struggle that uh, more social or less uh, the other. But at the end, uh, organization that was born 100 years ago to support poor people or people with problems has to be the majority of the efforts and the budget on the social side, and we decided to do it. Ruri, you want to make another comment? Yes, uh, it was you, about, about uh, the, last, uh, the last question. Yeah. Uh, I think that we, we really need to, to invest in uh, research in, our, in the way we work, in our own activities. I use the uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, method, but probably my fellow colleagues that deal with uh, biomedicine would ask me to speak about DNA and genetic manipulation. Maybe it's the time for foundations to do some genetic manipulation and find new ways of dealing with these totally new uh, challenges we are facing today. Okay. Uh, thank you. I realize I've almost jumped over one question. I still have six. So we can take the gentleman at the back there, then the lady there, and then meanwhile, when you finish speaking, sir, if your microphone can come forward to the lady three in front of you. So one, two, three, and I may take more because I'm keeping an eye on the watch now and we don't have that long and I want to make sure that everyone who's put their hand up has the chance to comment. Over to you, sir. Yeah, good morning. My name is Kurt Peleman from the European Venture Philanthropy Association and we are based in Brussels. I have a question on the role of foundations before the economic crisis. As a, as a kind of learning question, do you think that foundations could have done things better or different which could have prevented the economic crisis, or at least prevented that it goes so deep? My goodness, there are often expectations of us. That sounds like one of the greatest, but <laughs> thank you. The lady there, and if your microphone could come forward uh, to there. Uh, my name is Maria Liga from a therapeutic writing center from Ceres in North Greece. And I would like to ask you, uh, which is your opinion about the philosophy generally, or your philosophy especially, in the role of uh, foundations, uh, to non-governmental organizations, etc. And you think it's uh, to, um, to give uh, help at once, or they have to, um, to follow the actions of the organizations in, during the time, or both of them? A lovely question, but ooh, tight for time on that. <laughs> but the, a challenge for them. The lady there, and if your microphone could go across to the lady there. So, thank you. My name's Nancy Smith, I'm with the Salzburg Global Seminar, and one of the things we're trying to look at and understand is the shifting relationships between 
the philanthropic sector, the social sector, and the private business sector. Just put your microphone a little closer oh, to you. Sorry. No. Um, so the point has already been raised that the market rewards efficiencies, which is usually the leanest staff you can have. So there's a real tension in looking to the market for responses to social problems. At the same time, though, I think there's an understanding that the private sector is a largely untapped resource for creating social benefit or creating social value. And so one of the questions I have, and this is across the, the room, is what more foundations could be doing in working with private sector companies in looking at how the market can reward social value creation in addition to financial value creation. And that comes to the question of how endowments are used and how that's invested because we certainly those endowed institutions often feed the cycle uh, that they also try to counteract through their grant making, um, through knowledge, uh, and also through cooperation because uh, what we've also seen is in some early forays into the social sector that some private companies try to keep that mindset of, if I so solve the problem for A by doing this and this, I will get this result, and we all realize that the complexity of social problems is much deeper and cre needs a different kind of response than what a private sector company often looks at as you know, how they solve a problem. So it's a, it's a broad question and maybe it'll come up over the next day and a half, but I'd like to hear some early responses of changing endowment uh, investments, uh, also knowledge and partnership. Thank you very much. I realize that probably many of you have got bigger brains than me, but I'm not sure I can hold more than three questions in my head. So I will ask the panel to do that. And I have at least three. Yes, I haven't forgotten you, sir. They might look like I have. Um, I've got at least three or four more questions. And I would just comment on that. This is the only self-interest question. If you've read Effect magazine, you'll know that we in the UK have produced a very interesting guide on the role of governance and financial management of endowments, which I'd be very happy to let you have. And it's a little bit of thinking in that area. But if our wonderful panellists have composited those three questions and would like to make some offers and comments. Uh, Angle, why don't you start this time and give Rui a, a chance to breathe. Um, thanks. Uh, I, I thought that I had time during your intervention, but I, uh, l l let me think about your difficult question, I think. Uh, about the role of the foundations trying to prevent crisis I have, I, I think that it's no, I think it's not our role, but probably we have no capacity to, to, to do it. Uh, nowadays, I heard different professors or people who said, I said before the crisis that the crisis will come, but they haven't heard it before. Probably they, 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 they thought, probably they speak, but nobody hear this that voices so of course that we can have uh, a role promoting debate but i am not sure that we could prevent the crisis i think is the, the force is too big at, at least I, I i feel i feel that from the spanish perspective well, on the other questions if i understand if i understand properly your question on on, on what's better to to help uh, now or, or in short term or long, long term uh, needs I, I understand uh, for me for me it's a th that thought reminds me in the past i i was during a time uh, working in in the international Deve development program by oxfam in, in intermon oxfam in spain and in, in that moment when we uh, address programs in Peru, in Ecuador, or that's kind of, it was clear that just deliver fish is not enough and you have to teach how to fish. This was the idea, this was the, the rationale in that moment, uh, and all our thoughts were uh, always trying to, to do something more than deliver fish. Uh, nowadays, nowadays, I feel that during our what, what we are facing in our societies, 
it seems to me that uh, some people have forgot that. And we continue, or we establish, we are establishing a lot of uh, fish delivering programs and not teaching how to fish. And for me, for sure, when somebody has a, a specific need, uh, our organization has to address that. It's a humanitarian uh, obligation. But our main role has to be in the long term, because if not, who will then? Who will then? Probably public administration has always fought for years' time in, in, in delivering programs or not more. But who, who, who will work in a long term transformation if not independent organizations like foundation? So uh, th this is my, my thought on this F philosophy. I'm not sure if I understand, uh, if I answer the question as, 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 as uh, you uh, ask it. And on the private sector point, uh, for sure that our, uh, an organization like uh, Lakasha, it's open to collaborate uh, private sector with uh, non-for-profit. Non non, non of course, we, we are part of it. But uh, l l let me do another thought on that. Uh, Lakasha in this moment is struggling is struggling by keeping our legal status. La Caixa itself is a non-for-profit non non organization that was born 100 years ago. A lot of forces, troikas, and reports from all over the world wanted us to become um, a commercial bank, a, 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 yeah, a stockholder organization. Uh, as has happened in other countries. And we are struggling in that. Uh, now we have a system that the, this non-for-profit organization is still uh, in our head and had 60% of, of the shares of our commercial bank. But you know, all, from this uh, liberalization and, and, and liberalism um, philosophy, I, th I think that our role also is trying to fight ways to combine the efficiency of the market with uh, social commitment. And I think all that was made in the past with cooperative movements, with social enterprises, with all different styles of combining efficiency and solidarity, I think that we have to highlight. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, the, the forces are, uh, around us are against this only, only what is clear, only what is in the stock market, that it seems that is transparent for me, but or for, for so, some people, but for me it's not transparent at all, the stock market. But uh, I, I mean, I think part of our role should be to highlight and to experiment in new ways to combine market and solidarity, this way. Rui, nice. Thank you, Ang. Well, I, I think at, uh, at this moment, the panelists who deserve some grant from the foundations present because we are really tired, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure. It was a, a pleasure to, to, to be here and to, to, to get some so uh, uh, good questions. Uh, I took a lot of notes, uh, and uh, I think it was really very... Well, we haven't very quite finished yet. I've got three more questions to get, okay. Rui, so, d so don't okay. count your lunch just yet. <laughs> Sorry, you really will deserve a okay. reward, okay. but I, to so be fair, there's three people who I haven't forgotten yet. Okay. So I will try to give uh, quick answers, and then I will ask for a grant. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the first question was about uh, if we could prevent the crisis. Uh, Nurini wrote an article uh, about that and with that article he became one of the most expensive gurus asking I don't know how many thousands of dollars to deliver a lecture now. But uh, at the same time Alan Greenspan with the best team of economists of the United States he was not able to, to foresee, to prevent what happened. Uh, 
Antonio Tabucchi, uh, an Italian writer that, uh, is, uh, that died recently, in one of his last books he wrote, The Inevitable Never Happens, But the Unforeseeable Always Takes Place. And I think that this crisis is more or less this, we could not foresee it, so it happened uh, as it did. And uh, up to now, we are not being able, we are not being able to cope with it. The States and the United Kingdom are putting money in the economy. Uh, on the Eurozone, the doctrine is austerity. Maybe it's now starting to change, but these are two totally different approaches. Quantitative easing from the Anglo-Saxon side, restriction, fiscal consolidation, austerity in the conti European continent. Who is right? Who is effective? Up to now, it will be difficult to say who is more effective. And we do not have the theoretical tools to deal with this situation. No growth, no inflation, money put in the economies, and the world, the developed world, is not moving in the right direction. So it's a challenge for young economists to build new theories that help us to understand what is happening. Uh, the second question about what should be the right philosophy for foundations. Foundations have a mandate given by their founders. And uh, as trustees of our founders, we must try to follow their, their mandates. It's totally different to be in a foundation that by its bylaws is perpetual, like the Kaluskulbenken is perpetual, or in a foundation like Bill Gates, although the difference of size of capital, but that uh, is not perpetual and that uh, will spend its endowment during the lifetime of its founders. So the, the approach in the management of the endowment and in our spending policies is totally different in these different situations. But uh, what I try to say, quoting Joseph Rountree, is that uh, foundations must be agents for change to help societies to change, to, to do common good, to realize justice, and not to try to solve immediate problems, more, more times to cope with the symptoms and not the causes of the, the problems. The, the question of Nancy Smith, it's a recurrent question. Social re related investment or the best return with some ethics? Uh, I have no answer. Uh, I always tried when I was responsible to get the best return from our investments with some qualitative restrictions. No investments in uh, defense or aggressive industries. No investment in countries that do not follow the rule of law. But we never tried to 
do our, to realize our mission through our investment policy. But I consider it an open question, maybe for another seminar. Uh, but uh, it's an open question for all foundations. And I know that some of my colleagues have different views on that. But it's a, it's a very difficult trade-off. Rui, thank you. I am conscious of the time, but Rui has given me the lead in that being Anglo-Saxon, I'm going to impose my own quantitative easing on you, that your contribution to austerity is to postpone your lunch by about five minutes, because I do want to get the last three speakers in, and that's the lady there, the gentleman at the back, and then the microphone from you to go across to the colleague in the white hair. So one, two, three, off you go. Um, my name... My name is Tatiana Lintowska. I'm also coming from the Salzburg Global Seminar as my colleague Nancy, who asked the previous question. And I'm wondering about the greater role foundations can play in shaping and leading uh, debate at the macro level about the future of the social economic model in, in Europe and how it should involve, evolve uh, in order to be more sustainable. You mentioned several times the erosion of the welfare state in Europe. And while at the, at the moment uh, the main focus is on lingering the immediate consequences of the crisis, on protecting those who are most affected, perhaps foundations should also look into the future and, and, and think about the elements of, of a new system. Uh, many people think that once we are ready uh, and once we have dealt with this particular crisis, we have another crisis looming on the horizon, and this is about the uns uh, unsustainability of the current welfare states models in Europe and there are a number of questions to be addressed here uh, ranging from health and how to finance even rising costs to uh, pensions, labor markets and even the bigger question of whether advanced aging economies can strike a deal with young emerging countries in order to be able to sustain uh, at least a certain uh, level of uh, uh, welfare in, in Europe. And uh, there are many <laughs> Uh, there are many uh, good practices uh, accumulated by foundations and I'm wondering how these best practices uh, can be crystallized, aggregated and serve as building, building blocks for, uh, for, for, a, for a new system. So basically the question is yes, whether foundations can and how they can do better in, in being more forward uh, looking. If any of you have ever been known as someone who's gone to counselling, you know the famous phrase that's in the last five minutes of any one-hour session at the key questions. We have had some wonderful questions, but I don't think we're going to answer that one now. With my support of the colleagues organising, let us note that you've raised that very helpfully. I am not going to ask them to answer it, but to comment. The gentleman at the back and then the gentleman uh, nearby. So, yeah, that's, that's, off, off you go, yep. Yes. Uh, Rakis from the Stavros Niakos Just Foundation. Little closer to you. Yes. Uh, I don't have a question, so I mean... Lovely. But, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I just uh, want to reply to the question that Mr. Hip from the BMW Foundation had earlier with regards to the current You're situation. a wonderful man. Thank you for answering. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, we are about eight foundations in Greece right now who are active in uh, philanthropy. I don't have numbers uh, to give right now. I mean the current numbers, but I can tell you that a uh, few years back all of us were giving about 20 million per year. Uh, for this year I can tell you just what we're doing and uh, we have committed so far 28 million on, in 86 NGOs for the first six months of 2012. NGOs, with regards to the NGOs, uh, the number in the past used to be in the range of eight to 9,000. Many of them, you know, providing overlapping services, you know, it was a mess. Right now, I think crisis helped in a way because we only have about 25 to 3,000 of them. But 500 of them are the ones who address issues related to the crisis. I mean, social welfare issues and, uh, you know, medical. Uh, most of them are not well organized. Most of them are people-centric. Uh, they don't have the capacity to run large programs and we need right now no NGOs who are strong and have the capacity, and we're working toward that, di that direction. We enhance collaboration, we promote collaboration, you know, as much as we can. And uh, I must also say, 
with regards to your last point about uh, civic society, I don't want to say that it does not exist, because it does, but there is a lot of room for improvement, plenty of room. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And our last question. It should be on, just give them time. Just put it to your mouth and the colleagues behind you. Okay. You're away. Yes. Uh, it seems that I was not enough quick. So, Mr. John answered this question to Mr. Heap, who happened not to be here. But I have to verify the data that Mr. Terzakis has given to you. Let's say, in Greece, there are about 8,000 to 9,000 NGOs. The most of them, they are in and out. And about 600 of them, they are on the field of socioeconomic and uh, they are active. On the other side, I would just like to give uh, a hint uh, that uh, some of the speeches were a little bit uh, pessimistic about the foundations and all these kind of things. They say, yes, in comparison with the figures that they define the socioeconomic crisis, which are numbers about many trillions, the foundations are not participating in these figures. But the effect of the, of the foundation and the work of the NGOs is, having, is affected by the multiplier. In other words, if you invest something on the charity or the philanthropic sector, you have many savings in the society that they are not obvious. In other words, the crime. If you are not helping the people, the crime explodes. Do you want to say anymore? The, the problems, the social problems. Yeah. Yeah. If the people, they don't have to eat and they do not have any hope to find to eat something, then there is a revolution. This you cannot calculate. So the effectiveness in economic ways, but let's say the figures to be in expected losses, it is a very good investment for the society. Thank you so much, and thank you for that positive statement. Now, we're almost there. I want to give our two panelists a chance to make a couple of comments. I have a couple of comments and some thank yous, and then you really do get lunch, honest. But first, uh, Rui, would you like to make comments? Oh, no, Angle. Angle first, then Rui. Just, just a final comment on, on, on a big issue, a big debate on, on the role of foundations again. The, if I have to, to say it short, I think, uh, of course, that the think tank model, so thinking in, 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 in new models, could transform the society. But uh, most of our funders uh, fix in, in our mission that we have, to do, we have to be doers, not only thinkers. What will be extraordinary is that all of us, we have the capacity of think and do. Probably a think and do tank will be the best combination. And within that, I, I've seen different, different styles from 90% think, 10% do, or to the, the opposite, that, that probably will be the best. But of course that we need to think in new uh, societies. But for sure that our role, at least the role of the foundation that I'm representing is mainly do things because it's the, 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 the voluntary of the founders was that, to, to do things, to allow people to have opportunities. Is that, thank you. Thank you so much, Anko. And Marie. Well, I, I think that uh, the first question of this last group uh, deserves another seminar. Yeah. In any so we'll case, that through lunch, you know, we don't need in to. In any case, I, I remember that uh, someone said that sustainability is the new name for peace. And maybe this means that uh, we need to think about the dilemma between growth and distribution. And that uh, we need to reprint the Club of Rome report, Limits to Growth, that was published in 72 
and that uh, for a while became out of fashion. But I think that it's now time to reprint it and to read it again. The deceiving results of Rio Plus 20 conference oblige all of us to look carefully at the future of the planet. And uh, if everybody in the world had the, the level of life of my fellow citizens, and they are always complying, we need 1.7 planet. So we need to think about this. And uh, it's, of course, understandable that everybody would like to have the level of consumption of the Americans or the average Europeans, but it's not physically possible with the present size of the resources of the planet, particularly because we are spending resources that are not renewable. But that is obviously a team for foundations, and uh, I think that many foundations have not restriction of La Caixa and can help think tanks, and we need fresh thinking on many of the issues that were discussed today here. But I'd like to, to end thanking again the Stravos Niarcos Foundation for opening this agora for this very interesting and rewarding discussion. Thank you. And I'd just like to make two observations, not a summing up, but indeed, I welcome the thought that you know, we need a space for public debate and your very good suggestion that this is an agora uh, and looking on this morning's space is a very productive one and to thank the foundation for hosting us. But could I also just thank you, our translators at the back who've done sterling work, thank you very much, to our microphone holders, particularly to thank our two outstanding contributors and your perception and comments, which have been so helpful. But most of all, to thank you. You've been a terrific audience. You've lots of questions. You've got us started. Keep that energy. Keep going. We'll have a great two days. Now you can have lunch. Thank you. desk. Lunch by the registration desk. Thank you.